and uh, welcome to the Real World Crypto session. Uh, we have two super interesting talks. The first one is about uh, the end-to-end -end encrypted Zoom uh, protocol for meetings, proving security and strengthening liveness. And the speaker is Antonio uh, Marchedone, and uh, yeah, the stage is yours. Hi, thank you for the introduction. This is joint work with uh, Balachander from Zoom and uh, Gany and uh, Daniel from NYU who were contracting with us for a little bit on this project. So I don't really need to tell you how important uh, group video communication has, been, has become in our daily lives, especially since, uh, since the pandemic. Um, Zoom is like one of the major players in this space and we have been offering the option to add end-to-end -end encryption to meetings since October of 2020. At the same time, we also published a white paper that describes the protocol and does an informal security analysis, but there have been no formal definitions for the problem of like group uh, and to encrypted communications, not just for our protocol, but also in general. And uh, this is in contrast to the related field of end-to-end -end encrypted messaging where there's been like tons of research, there are very well-established protocols, there are even like standardization efforts. And, um, I will argue that uh, uh, the two fields are slightly different and so more analysis on the meeting side is necessary. The first difference is the length of a session, like a chat conversation can last even for years while typically video meetings are, up, uh, are only up to like a few hours long. And uh, so in the, in, it is important to limit the damage when uh, uh, compromise happens during like a messaging session. Uh, and, and I'm talking about properties like, such as forward secrecy and post-compromise security. While maybe in the meeting space, since the sessions are so short, it is enough if uh, your, your meeting remains confidential as long as your client is compromised either before or after the meeting, if this allows for simpler and more efficient protocols. Um, another important difference is that meetings are synchronous. So one thing that we can do in this, on, on this side of the spectrum is enforce liveness. By liveness I mean, for example, that uh, if uh, the, the host of a meeting kicks someone out of the meeting and rotates the key, the other participants need to learn about this within a short time frame so that the, 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 like the a malicious network attacker cannot, uh, cannot delay the, this information too much and the, the participant is actually kicked out. So in, in this work, we start bridging this gap by uh, defining and formalizing the, the security of the, the key agreement part that's at the core of Zoom's end-to-end uh, -end encrypted meeting protocol. So we, we follow like a modular approach that mirrors what the white paper was doing. And so we formalize two primitives. The first one is a continuous multi-recipient uh, multi like key encapsulation, which is essentially a primitive that allows a leader to distribute a stream of keys to a, um, to a mutable uh, set of participants. And then we use this primitive to build, the, um, to build this notion of leader-based continuous group key agreement with liveness, which adds on top of the stream of keys consistency for the group, so the participants keep track of who else is in the meeting, and also liveness, so the, the, the meeting actions and key rotations need to happen within like, a short amount of time from when they are initiated. So we also proved that, uh, that our, our core protocol satisfies these definitions, and uh, uh, we also go a little bit further. So as part of this, uh, this project, we noticed that uh, uh, the protocol could be improved. So we have two different ways of strengthening the protocol, and actually one of them uh, we managed to implement and deploy, and it is available since version 5.13 of the, of the client. Uh, before I continue, a quick legal disclaimer. You know, I'm going to simplify omit details. Uh, this is for informational purposes only. Uh, please see our white paper for up-to-date information. All right. So the first, uh, the first primitive is this multi-recipient uh, um, key encapsulation me mechanism, or CMCAM. As I said, it allows a leader to distribute a stream of keys to this mutable set of participants. One peculiarity of this, uh, this primitive is that um, um, like the parties have long-term identities, so we assume that there is like some sort of PKI here, but for each meeting they also create an, uh, an ephemeral identity. 
And uh, each meeting with this, like, ephemeral, this ephemeral identity can be used uh, across multiple sessions where each session is a stream of keys that comes from a different leader. Because like in the course of meetings, the host of the meeting can drop out, then we need to pick a different leader and we're still in the same meeting. And so at the end of the meeting, the, 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 the ephemeral identity gets erased and so you gain security even, after, even if your key is compromised up afterwards. So our keys in this, in this primitive are indexed by two counters, the, uh, the identity of the leader and two counters, the epoch and a sub-epoch, which, which we call period. And the idea is that switching periods within the same epoch is supposed to be more efficient, but is only secure when adding participants and not when removing them. And the counters keep going even if leaders change. So our security, it's a game-based definition. Uh, the main properties are this key confidentiality, essentially keys, uh, can, are indistinguishable from random unless you corrupt uh, one of the long-term identities that, uh, that is connected to an ephemeral identity that had access to, to the keys, so this weak form of forward secrecy I was talking before. And uh, also, if the, even after a long-term identity has been uh, compromised, if uh, the uh, adversary doesn't interfere with the, with the generation of the ephemeral identity, that specific session maintains um, maintains security. Um, the other property is key consistency, essentially as long as the leader and the party who receives the key, the participant have not, as long as either of them has been compromised, they should agree on what the key is. And stronger notions are possible here, but we are exactly modeling what Zoom is doing. Um, so how does Zoom's protocol work? Very, uh, very, very briefly, uh, for these ephemeral identities, we use the Fiamman keys uh, to distribute the key. The, 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 the leader essentially picks, uh, picks a key, uh, a seed, sorry, and it performs the Fiamman key agreement with each of the participants, and then it sends them the key encrypted using uh, authenticated encryption with uh, using the key that's the result of the Fiamman. Um, and from this seed, the participants can like uh, ratchet it forward uh, uh, for each period in order to generate like the stream of keys for that uh, for that epoch. Um, the security is in the random oracle model. Um, two advantages of this modular approach are one that we hope that this primitive is helpful in other contexts before beyond that when encrypted meetings, and also the fact that we realize that like this uh, this this simple protocol that I have uh, just. Uh, described can be replaced with more efficient ones, such as the one, one that one might imagine based on TreeCam. We haven't done it yet, but, uh, but it, is, it would be very simple and would, uh, we, we would keep the analysis. So on top of this, uh, we, we build uh, this notion of leader-based uh, uh, continuous key agreement with liveness, and uh, the functionality is similar to the one of the, of the CMCAM that I just showed you. But the, in addition, as a, participants keep track of the group roster, and this notion also accounts for time. So in the, formaliz in the security formalization, we have the algorithms take the current time as input, and there are also time-based events that can be triggered. And the adversary is the one advancing the clock. So the properties that we get from this notion are, again, key confidentiality and consistency, as before. In addition, we have this notion of group consistency. So the participants and uh, two participants that have the same, that are talking to the same honest leader will agree not only on the, on the current state of the group, but also on the history of the group since the later of them joined the meeting. Um, and so the meeting, if the meeting, if, the, uh, if an attacker partitions the meeting, then these partitions cannot be reconciled because the histories are different. Uh, the other important and most novel property is this key liveness. So the participants of a meeting are either up to date with the meeting state or they drop out of the meeting. More formally, we say that for any like participant that is acting in, in the meeting so that doesn't drop out, the leader of that uh, uh, of that meeting, according to the participant, has been in the same state, so in the same epoch, period, with the same group and the same key, recently. Where recently means uh, uh, within like a small uh, factor of live, that we call liveness luck, which is this protocol dependent parameter that accounts for the fact that there is some network delay and so people are not expected to be exactly synchronized, but can wait, can be a few, a few seconds or a few minutes behind. So, in the security formalization here, uh, we assume that parties' clocks go at the same speed, which is reasonable because meetings are short and they are run on modern devices, but we do allow for like arbitrary offsets between the clocks. Um, how, do we, uh, how do we achieve this? 
we, we use the protocol that I was describing before, the CMCAM, to distribute the keys. For group consistency, the, the, the leader simply um, sends a participant list uh, that describes the group for every epoch and period, and this, this participant list uh, is authenticated by the leader also sending um, signed heartbeats. That, uh, that both authenticate this participant list and also provide a mechanism to enforce liveness because they include uh, uh, a timestamp and uh, the current epoch, the period, and also a hash of the previous heartbeat so that the, whole, the, the, the latest heartbeat always um, authenticates the whole, the whole history of the meeting. And obviously participants need to only start using a key after the corresponding participant list and heartbeat have been received. Um, let's see how signing this, uh, receiving these signed heartbeats can actually help enforce liveness. So what participants do is that they maintain an upper bound delta on the offset between their clock and their leader's clock. And now they, they can drop out of the meeting if they detect that uh, according to their estimate, the last heartbeat that they received from the leader was generated too long ago. And by too long ago, I mean by a, this, uh, there is this constant of the protocol that we call Delta Live that, uh, that describes this offset. So THP in this, in, this, in this equation is the time at which uh, is the timestamp that is included in the heartbeat. Delta is the offset that allows the participant to translate this timestamp according to the, their own local clock, and delta is this, uh, is this tolerance, and t now is the current time. So if the equation is um, um, uh, satisfied, the, the, the participant will drop out. Um, how do we set this offset, um, this estimate? The, the, it is set as the minimum difference between the time that is indicated in any heartbeat that the participant receives and the local time at which it was received. So let's, give a, let's see an example. In this case, Alice, um, so the, the, the two lines represent the time according to the local clock of the participants. Um, so in this case, the two Alice and, uh, and the leader have perfectly synchronized clocks. So Alice will generate her ephemeral identity at time zero, and the leader receives it at time one, and then the leader can like, at this point, Alice will start a timer when she joins the meeting, and she will say, I will drop out of the meeting unless I hear from the leader by this time Delta Live, which in, my, in our example is gonna be 10. So the leader can like send this heartbeat, and maybe this heartbeat is not delivered immediately, it takes until time 10 for Alice to receive it, and when she receives it, she can set this offset to nine, which is you know, 10 minus one. And uh, so after she has received this heartbeat, Alice will delay dropping out until, until time 20. Why do we set, now we see that the, the, the two, uh, the Alice and the leader are synchronized, but, uh, but we are setting this, uh, this time to nine, this offset to nine, which is pretty big. Why do we do this? It's because if you, you can see in the picture on the right, that we, another situation that is consistent with Alice's view is the fact that, you know, this, uh, the message from Alice to the leader uh, arrived much later, and then the heartbeat was actually delivered pretty fast, but the two clocks were not synchronized. Since Alice cannot distinguish between the two, she takes a conservative approach and uses like an upper bound. Um, note that if over the course of the, of the meeting, since we're using a minimum, even if over the course of the meeting, this like network delay uh, improves, so if, for example, this heartbeat, the second heartbeat here is sent at time nine, received at time 11, Alice can update her estimate um, and, uh, and these savings this, this new estimate re remains valid even if the network delay increases again. So in this case, we see that Alice has received an heartbeat at time 21, but despite that, she will drop out just a second later because she does realize that this heartbeat must be old because she knows that the, 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 the network delay has, must have increased. And note that when Alice has, is just interacting with one leader, the difference between her estimate delta and the actual offset has to be at most delta live. Why is this the case? Because, um, because essentially this estimate, this difference is essentially equivalent to the ne network delay on the packets. And since we know that like Alice started at time zero and received the first heartbeat before time delta live, this is the maximum amount that uh, the delivery must have been taken because the heartbeat must have been generated after time zero because it includes the Alice's key. Um, so when you, when, you, when you start formalizing this and, and, and try to come up with a theorem, this is what you get for the, for the liveness slack. We have the first term which bounds the error between 
the, uh, the estimate delta and the actual offset, and the second term, which is this plus delta live, accounts for the fact that after receiving the heartbeat, Alice will wait for that long before dropping out. If you look at the first term a little bit more, n is the number of distinct leaders that, uh, that Alice has encountered so far, and t now minus t join is the time that Alice or the participant has spent in the meeting. And like this theorem is, uh, holds as long as all the leaders that Alice uh, or the participant has encountered are, uh, have been honest. So this is great, and the Zoom is the Zoom is the first video communication protocol which has this formal liveness guarantees, but like the next question is can we do better? I mean, first, is this like theorem tight? Um, we can see that, um, um, that the first term was n times delta live, and we, we can see that that is actually justified. So this example starts the same as, as the one before, but imagine that there was also a second party, L2, L2 we, we received the first heartbeat like sort of shortly after it was sent. So this heartbeat is received at time two. And let's say that then this party becomes the leader of, uh, of the protocol. So now this party will send a heartbeat and a network attacker can delay delivering this heartbeat to Alice until time 20 because that was the time at which she was gonna drop out. And so when Alice computes the, the her estimate delta two with the new leader, she, it will be like in this case 18, which is bigger than delta live. And we can see how for each new leader, like this game can be played where the adversary can delay further by an additional delta live term. Um, and however, in this case, the, everybody is synchronized. Um, so in addition, I don't have much time to go into this, so I'm gonna skip it, but like this problem is compounded when one of the previous leaders is malicious because essentially they can uh, pre-generate a bunch of heartbeats so that, uh, so that this problem can, can be accentuated. Um, we have two proposals that improve on these points. The first one essentially starts with the observation that um, if you have like well-synchronized clocks, um, it doesn't make, it, it, you, can, you can get better liveness properties when the clocks are actually well synchronized at the cost of worse correctness when they aren't. So you can have a protocol where if the parties are well synchronized, you get good liveness, and if they are not, people will drop out from the protocol a little bit too much. So the, the idea is that participants maintain an upper bound and a lower bound on the, on the offset and only update their, um, uh, they, they only correct the time in the heartbeat if this, um, if this bound is, uh, uh, if, if, if they're sure that this bound can be improved by that correction. The advantages uh, I already talked about, like, um, but this, this still depends, this has no additional interaction, but still depends on the previous leader being honest. The second proposal to strengthen the protocol is just to add additional interaction. So each participant can regularly send to the server an unpredictable nonce at regular intervals, and then the leader can include this nonce in the first CMCAM message that they send uh, to the participant. And this essentially ensures uh, for the participant that this message is recent, the same way that like the first heartbeat that they receive when they join the protocol must be recent because it includes their key. And so this is the, the theorem that you, that, you, that you get when you try to formalize this protocol. We can see that, this, that there is this term, the n times delta live can be now bounded by three. Um, and so we get, and this happens regardless of whether past leaders were corrupted or not. Um, so this is like, uh, this is great, and this is the protocol that we have deployed since version 5.13. And to be precise, what we have deployed is a slight variant where these nonces are not generated at constant intervals, but the, the, the frequency depends on the number of, of, of parties that are in the meeting, and this is because uh, for efficiency we didn't want to have too much traffic, and we will describe uh, this in more detail in the, in the full version of the paper. So to conclude, um, we, have, uh, we have designed like a protocol that in our model achieves very good like liveness guarantees. There is a lot of like interesting uh, future directions such as looking at the insider security, protocols that are not based on a leader, or like expand the model to include uh, the security of the whole meeting. We talk a little bit about it, about how to do it in the paper, but there's, we don't have like a formal definition for that. And the last thing I wanted to say is that analyzing real world, uh, real world protocols 
um, is very useful. And this project demonstrates how like, us collaborating with, uh, with academia, with like, Daniel and Jenny, has made possible like, an upgrade to our protocol that, is, that benefits the security of, of all our users. So it is, it is a model that I think works and that I would encourage other companies to pursue. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we have time for one very quick question. If you want to ask, come f to the front, to the microphone. Um, if not, maybe I have a quick question. As far as I understood Zoom, maybe this is uh, 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 false, but I understood that the server at Zoom uh, chooses for the recipients, for the clients, which the best video stream would be to enhance quality. But if you have end-to-end -end encryption, how can the server help the clients to uh, identify the best stream? Will there be multiple send in parallel, or how does that work? Yeah. Yeah, precisely, and like you know, the, the, that decision is just based on the bandwidth. So, um, okay, so the sender will up the sender uh, will upload multiple multiple streams. Okay, and that that works for senders. Huh? That works for senders. That like the the overhead is manageable. I mean, they, they we have it in production. It works, so I guess. Uh, Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's uh, thank Antonio again, and we uh, have the second. Talk. While we're getting set up, the second talk has the title Caveat Implementer, Key Recovery Attacks on Mega. And uh, Lenka Marekova will give the talk. And uh, the slides are set up, great. So the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so this is joint work with Martin Albrecht, Mira Holler, and Kenny Patterson. Now, Mega is an end-to-end -end encrypted cloud storage and communication platform with more than 280 million registered users at this moment. And um, previous work by Backendall, Holler, and Patterson, which you may have heard about at Real World Crypto last month, gave five attacks on this platform. And the first two of these completely broke the confidentiality of user files. Now, Mega did not implement the countermeasures that were suggested by the authors of these attacks and instead decided to rely on the validation of plain text payloads. These checks were sufficient to prevent those specific attacks, but not sufficient in general. And in this talk, I will show how we broke the patched version. Our new attacks by, are enabled by a couple of things. So first, um, this is the continued lack of key separation and integrity protection, which was already present in the um, original design. Then um, it's the existence of an ECB encryption oracle, which is present in Megadrop, which is a feature that is completely unrelated to the actual uh, protocol under attack. And finally, we use uh, the detailed reporting of errors that are sent by the client to the server, which were added shortly after the patch for the original attacks. And one could say that our attacks are inspired by the small subgroup attacks on Diffie-Hellman key exchange, as well as on the key overwriting attacks on OpenPGP. Now, um, first I will give a very high level view of uh, the way user keys are derived in Mega. So first, each user has a symmetric 128-bit encryption key, which is derived from their password. They also have another symmetric key, which is the master key. They have a 2048-bit RSA key pair and a number of file encryption keys, which uh, encrypt the individual files that are stored in that user's uh, cloud storage. You can see um, the hierarchy of these keys on the slides. And so um, to allow users to log in on multiple devices, um, only the encryption key is the one that is derived from their password, and all of the other keys are stored in encrypted form on the server. And so I use this bracket notation to mean that the master key is encrypted using the encryption key, and then the file encryption keys as well as the RSA private key are encrypted using the master key. And you see ASECB here, you're probably already hearing a loud warning sign, 
but um, in this case, because they only use, uh, use it to encrypt material that is very unlikely to repeat, we will only be using the fact that it's malleable. Now, the last thing I should mention is so-called shared file um, encryption keys, which encrypt files that are sent by other people to this user, and they are encrypted under their um, public RSA key. Now, uh, I will look a bit in more, more detail on how the um, encrypted private RSA key is stored because it's relevant for our tags, since this is the key that we will be overwriting. Now, in particular, um, it's a custom encoding for a more efficient uh, RSA decryption using the Chinese remainder theorem. And in Mega, this is referred to as the priv key. And in particular, this format um, encodes the prime factors PQ, the secret exponent D, as well as the value U, which is uh, Q inverse mod P. Each of these values is prefixed with the two byte length field. And uh, the whole thing is split into 16 byte blocks for ASECB. So in particular, you can notice that these length fields um, push all of these values um, so that nothing is block aligned anymore. And this complicates our tags a little bit. Now, this is a simplified view of the protocol that takes place every time a user logs into Mega, and this includes authentication and uh, session, key, uh, session ID exchange. So you can see that when the user logs in, the Mega server first retrieves um, some information from storage. So this is the encrypted keys and other data. It picks, <coughs> it picks a random session ID and it encrypts this uh, session ID alongside some other information uh, using RSA. It then sends this uh, retrieved uh, encrypted keys as well as the RSA ciphertext to the user. And the user first um, decrypts their master key and then uses this master key in this uh, function that I called a mega deck here. And this includes both AES ECB decryption as well as RSA decryption. The result of this should be the session ID, which it then sends to the server, and the server accepts or rejects based on this. For our tags, we are interested in what happens when mega servers maliciously change the inputs that go into this mega deck function. So I will zoom in a bit on uh, what happens within this function. So as I mentioned, we have these two steps. First, we have the AES ECB decryption. Uh, which retrieves the secret RSA key. And then the secret RSA key is used to decrypt the RSA ciphertext. And the key issue here is that both of these steps rely on validity checking of the decrypted values and return distinguishable errors to the server. We rely on both explicit and implicit errors. So first, explicit errors arise from this validity checking. In particular, in the second step, there is a length check on the plain text, which together with the legacy padding check reveals if the second byte of the plain text is zero. And we use this in our second attack. Then what, I mean, what do I mean by implicit errors? These arise due to bugs in the low level library that Mega uses for big integer arithmetic. And in particular, in the first step, um, the failure in recomputing the inverse of Q mod P reveals whether the greatest common divisor of P and Q are not one. And so this enables our first attack. Now, the final ingredient um, that I will need for our attacks is this um, ECB encryption oracle, which arises in Megadrop. Megadrop is a feature that lets anyone upload files to a folder in the cloud storage of the recipient. And the issue here is that for these files, clients automatically re-encrypt the received shared file keys. So in very simplified form, you can see how a malicious server can use this to construct an ECB encryption oracle by essentially pretending to upload a file to the target user's cloud storage, and it chooses uh, some key material, and the user's client automatically re-encrypts this key material under their own master key and then stores it back on the server. So as I said, a malicious provider can use this to construct an ECB encryption oracle without user interaction 
and without actually leaving traces on the user's client. Now I will describe the attacks. So as I said, we are in the setting of a malicious service provider, um, which is the one that Mega claims uh, your files should be secure under. And our goal as an attacker is to obtain ECB decryption ability under this master key. So you can see it highlighted on the key hierarchy. Um, this allows an attacker to recover both the private RSA key as well as any of the file encryption keys. And so in particular, this means an attacker can both impersonate the client as well as um, decrypt any of their files. And the cost of the attacks will be measured mainly in the number of login attempts because we are exploiting the login procedure. Now the first attack is based on the error in the modular inverse computation. And uh, I will introduce a bit of notation first. So this is how we denote the target ciphertext block that we want to decrypt, the ECB encryption oracle, as well as the error that is output by the client and sent to the server if um, the decrypted values of P and Q have a common factor. The main idea is to construct a modified encryption of proof key using the ECB encryption oracle and the target ciphertext block so that P mod R is zero for a small prime R and Q contains the target B in the least significant position. This is done in such a way so that uh, getting this inverse error means that Q mod R is zero. And so by adjusting Q until we hit this error, we can learn the value of B mod R. And then we simply repeat this for a set of primes such that the product is at least 128 bits long so that we can learn the actual value of B um, using the Chinese remainder theorem. The average cost of this attack is around 600 login attempts and between 60 and 90 um, ECB encryption oracle queries, which we have uh, confirmed experimentally. Now we give two versions of this attack. First, um, I'm showing the overwritten proof key for the simple version where we have reduced the size of the fields so that everything is block aligned. And you can see that Q embeds the um, target plain text as well as the test value T, which we vary over the course of the attack. And uh, you can also see that P is divisible by the small prime RI. One issue is that such a, this version could still be prevented by adding yet more validation checks, for example, just a length check on these fields. So we also develop a full version which uses more valid looking values and parts of the original um, brief key ciphertext. But um, the attack mechanism is essentially the same. Now our second attack is a small subgroup attack which is uh, targeting the same goal as the first one. But now we are exploiting the behavior of the RSA decryption function. This is an excerpt from the code, um, and it does the following. So you can see that there is a conditional statement um, depending on the value of the second byte of the plain text. And this was in the code only explained as a legacy padding check. Now, because this is followed by a length check on the plain text, it essentially means that the error reveals whether the second byte of the plain text is zero. And again, this error is sent to the server and is distinguishable from all of the other errors. Now, the main idea is, again, to construct a modified encryption of the proof key. But in this case, D will contain the, uh, the target plaintext in the least significant position. And P and Q will be such that the product P minus one times Q minus one will have a number of small prime factors Ri. In this case, we also replace the RSA ciphertext with a value that will be of the form G to the X mod PQ, where G has order RI in the multiplicative group of integers mod PQ, and there we know that there exists a value such that T, such that G to the T mod PQ has second byte zero. And this we can ensure in a pre-computation stage. Then X will be our test value, 
so that whenever we hit this um, particular error, we will learn that x times d is congruent to t module ri. And so we learn the value of b mod ri, and then we can proceed um, the same as in the first attack. This one uh, requires more pre-computation, as well as a larger number of logins, but a smaller number of ECB encryption oracle calls. And we include it mainly to demonstrate the fragility of the system, because um, this attack uses a variety of errors that are different from the first one. Now, before, um, sorry. So, if we had used the previous attacks naively, um, to recover the entire private RSA key, we would need to repeat them up to nine times. So instead, we recover only four blocks of Q. <clears throat> then we run an exhaustive search for the last 16 bits, and this is because these length fields push um, all of the values outside of block alignment. And finally, we can recover the remainder efficiently using lattice reduction. So, before I conclude, um, there is one more attack to mention in the spirit of attacks only getting better. Now, after the previous attacks of Beck and Bill Holler and Pat Patterson, Mega claimed um, that they were not practical because of the number of login attempts they needed, because um, surely nobody logs in that many times. However, um, we discovered that using this ECB encryption oracle, which was already present um, when the first attacks were discovered, um, this could be used to optimize one of these attacks on unpatched clients. And the result of this is that the entire private RSA key could have been recovered using only two login attempts, um, which is a con contrast to the original 512 or the six of the optimized version of uh, Ryan and Henninger. In terms of uh, disclosure, we disclosed to them last September and we suggested mitigations which were largely similar to the ones that were originally suggested. But this time they agreed and uh, informed us that they were working on a larger redesign. This was meant to change how private keys are stored, so they are finally adding integrity protection. They have removed the ECB encryption oracle and replaced the low level library that was um, the source of our implicit bugs. And this upgrade happened last month. Um, we have um, provided feedback on these changes, but we have not reviewed them in detail. And Mega has also awarded a bug bounty. Now I have a couple of uh, takeaway points to discuss. So first, as I said, the root causes were already identified in previous work, but it took multiple series of attacks um, for them to actually implement some of the suggested mitigation, mitigations. The ECB encryption oracle is interesting since um, it comes from a completely independent feature of the protocol that was under attack and shows the fragility of the system. Finally, our attacks also serve as another example of key overwriting attacks, which perhaps deserve more exploration. And so it's clear that more cryptanalysis of protocols in the wild is needed if we want to achieve the adoption of more secure and formally analyzed cryptographic solutions in practice. You can see more um, at the link. And yeah, thank you for your attention. Yeah, that was great on time, so we have time for questions. Uh, come to the microphone if you have some. Um, maybe in the meantime, from my side, um, you proposed mitigations to Mega, but uh, were these mitigations uh, reinventing a new protocol, downloading all the ciphertext, decrypting, updating, and encrypting with a new protocol? Or did you have hope that some of the parts of the Mega protocol are still, were still useful? So the original um, paper actually had kind of three levels of different countermeasures, starting from kind of the easiest to implement, um, but probably not formally provable, down to uh, like a more complex set of um, recommendations. So, but it's difficult to kind of fix the, you know, fix the plane while it's running. So we did recognize that, but. Um, I think there were clearly parts that were salvageable, if that's what you were asking. Okay. 
any other questions? Maybe a second question from me. Um, how did you how did you look at the or how did you find these uh, vulnerabilities? Did you look deeply into the code, or uh, what was your access to understand uh, that these bugs, that these oracles exist? So um, for this work, um, it was kind of uh, maybe more limited in scope because there was all this previous work that explored parts of the code base. And so now we specifically wanted to look at what the patches changed. And then basically, because we believed that those patches were not sufficient, we looked for ways we could potentially um, exploit this. And then during experimentation, all of these bugs started to come up, basically. And all of that was open source, so you could look into yes. the code? I see. Okay. They have open source uh, their client. OK. So thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, I'm wondering, given the presence of an ECB oracle, uh, and given that I presume by ECB you mean electronic codebook, a notoriously insecure mode of operation, uh, were you expecting to find anything uh, like anything interesting relating to the fact that it was ECB uh, or any vulnerabilities that way? And did it go anywhere, or would you like to see if it goes anywhere? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, it has led to these attacks. Um, we haven't explored whether it leads to anything. More. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, mostly just did the fact that it was ECB alone uh, lead to any alarms, or did you have to combine it with other? Uh... So it had to be combined with other stuff, but ECB made it very easy to basically, um, you know, use the ECB or use the Oracle to get particular blocks and then place them wherever we needed to in the particular overwritten keys. So in okay. sense, it enabled the attack. I see. It was not enough. Alrighty, so. thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, let's uh, thank Lenka again, and uh, this is the end of the session. We now have a 30 minutes uh, coffee break.